Hey everyone, and welcome back to the AI and Humans podcast. I'm your host, Adima Zolkario, product design and AI expert, and the creator of an online leaders program, Unlocking the Power of Generative AI. And today, we're taking a deep dive into the world of venture capital and its vital role in driving innovation in the AI space. Joining us is Terry Pound, a seasoned VC partner with ex extensive experience in investing in AI startups. We'll be exploring in the landscape of AI investment and key trends shaping the industry and the strategies for spotting the next big thing in AI. Get ready for the conversation packed with insightful perspective from the world of adventure capital. Hi, Perry. Adi, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Perry? Good. It's always nice to see you. Always nice to see you, and I'm sure it's going to be really interesting. Perry Pound is a partner of Unity Group, right? That's right. Now we can start. What are the current hot areas in investment in the AI space and what makes them so attractive to VCs? Well, you know, I think, um, and, and I would say, you know, uh, speaking as somebody who knows Adi a little bit, I know she's an expert in AI as well. And so uh, I'm, I'm uh, happy to be on the podcast and also would always want to turn it back to her uh, for, for, for her insights. But uh, sure. basically, you know, like everybody... Uh, You know, like everybody else, we understand, you know, generative AI, uh, but it's, it's, it's the application of AI right now. So whether it's healthcare, whether it's climate tech, whether it's defense tech, space tech, uh, I think the companies that succeed are going to be the companies that are able to apply the tools of AI in new and different ways. And so we're always on the lookout for those opportunities. And I think every, call it every quarter exponentially, you're going to see more of an application to AI. into different pieces in different sectors. Right. And, and in general, I think the foundational LLMs uh, are already built. Maybe the last one would be Elon Musk's one. And other right. than that, it's going to be like smaller, very focused niche uh, models that right. we'll see. And I think the implications of that is that people would want to see solutions for a specific domain. So what would be like the main issues types of domains do you think that AI would be there? Well, I think, I think you're going to see, um, you're, you're going to see so many different domains. I was on the phone. I've, I've been on the phone with a lot of different groups right now. So after this, I have a pitch from a space tech group using AI last week. Uh, and we're, we're talking to somebody that has an ed tech AI. Uh, we, I talked to somebody yesterday with a fintech AI. So, and this isn't even, You know because we're we're working on our uh, to raise the fund at the same time as we're starting to deploy, and so this isn't even trying hard to go find these opportunities. opportunities are, are, are coming to us from the network, and they're all so, so far they're all very interesting opportunities. The things that people are doing are, are fascinating. So I think from a from a VC perspective, you're, you're sort of trying to uh, you, you know, if you think back to several years ago, right? And looking at technologies and saying okay what's gonna you know you're always looking around the corner right so what's what's coming up next uh, you know what are some of the challenges that might make the technology that we're working with obsolete right with AI I would say that's exponential so you're mm -hmm. you're, you're looking around the corner I, I think the existential threat is if you're I mean with within the companies you're investing in or uh, the threat is what makes this unique enough that one of the larger companies is not able just to keep it for themselves right or, or, or right. do a better job with it so that's yeah. sort of I, i think that's a challenge for all the uh for all the smaller ai builders so some of them are saying like well we we you know we don't see you know one of the big groups even wanting to do this because it's so niche right this would be kind of a waste of their efforts it wouldn't be big enough yeah um so it's it, it's sense. it's fascinating right now Yeah. yeah, I think that another aspect would be, do they have the data that is very specific for this domain? And right. let's say it's like a company that is like an insurance company that has so, so much data re related to their specific needs. And then it's very hard to, to compete with that because they have something that big companies don't really have. That's right. That's right. Do you have the data? And so, you know, part of it is, I think, if, if you look at some of the smaller companies, they're working hard. In some cases, not even really raising money yet, just just trying to get clients right and by getting clients and the more clients they get, the more data they'll get 
Right. And so it's it, it's it's a big uh, it, it's it's very capital intensive for some of these groups. So you, so you see some high net worth people really saying, okay, I'm going to put in millions of dollars with with just you know maybe they have one partner founder who has a high net worth. The whole point is to go out and create the data first before going you know before going out and really competing at scale. So yeah. that's definitely uh, an approach. Yeah, only when they have the the data, they could have something which they could compete with. Before that, right. it's, it's very hard to compete because these big models, they know a lot and they have lots of data within them. And if it's not 100%. very specific, it's like, what, what is the value that you're bringing to the table after all? Right, right, 100%. Yeah. yeah. So what are the, big, the biggest challenges and opportunities that VCs face when investing in AI startups? You know, I think, um, you know, one of the things is you've, I mean, we just touched on a little bit, right? And we yeah, said, the, you know, what like, what they what they call data moat. This is how they call right. that you need enough data, right? That's right. That's right. That uh, I I think the uh, for for VCs there's a technical complexity, right? That uh, to understanding what's going to make a good investment and what's not. So like on our team, we've got somebody who had a lot of experience with LLMs prior to GPTs, uh, and and now he's sort of uh, and so he's able to to dig in from more of an expertise perspective than some. I mean, certainly than me, right? Uh, I, I'm 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 fortunate to be learning from him on this. Um, I think also the the regulatory risks, right? Right. So right. Right now we're trying to. It, it's a very fine line. Uh, there, there's a book I read recently called The Conservative Futurist, and it's it's a book on policy. And so this is a guy that works at the American Enterprise, uh, uh, you know, think tank, right in in DC. And so he was saying. Um, if you go back to the 70s, so the U.S. had an economic growth rate of about 5% in the 60s. And then in the 70s, we came up with a lot of different regulations. And he was saying it wasn't that the regulations were so bad, like clean, who doesn't want clean air and who doesn't want clean water, right? Sure. It was more like the ability of uh, small groups of people to stop development. Yeah. Uh, you know, you might in real estate development, they call it NIMBYs, right? Not in my backyard. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, but but that happened kind of across the board. And so if you say, uh, if we did something similar today and we stopped or, or slowed down growth too much, he, he was saying we went from 5% to 2%. And, and so he said, if you just kind of carry it across, right, the average income now in the US, instead of being 70,000, would be 300,000. Mm. So he said it really slowed down opportunities for a lot of people. And, it, you know, so, I, you know, there's there's that there's that risk where you want to have smart regulations that don't inhibit the potential and don't slow down the, uh, you know, human flourishing. And at the same time, you really have to focus on the alignment challenge. Right. And so understanding yeah. the regulatory risks, you know, we're, we're, we're based in Washington, D.C. And then we also have a base in California, you know, a secondary base in California. So I think we're close to a lot of the creators in California but we're also close to the policy in DC and we have a pretty good network there of uh, people working in Congress and people working in think tanks and working in technology labs. And so we're watching that all the time. Like, how is that, how is that unfolding? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I think I, I, from another standpoint, you're looking at uh, uh, competition, right? Like we talked about right. before, uh, what, what allows your group to go versus, uh, you know, another investment you might make on behalf of your, of your uh, investors. It just gets eaten up, you know. Right. And so we talked a little bit about how you try to avoid that. Uh, so, yeah. so I think those are those are some of the key uh, key metrics and and issues. Yeah, I think what you said about the regulation. So on one side, everybody wants a responsible AI and regulations that would somehow have some kind of guardrails to this technology. Right. On the other hand, if it's very specific. Smaller companies would not be able to to just uh, rely on these regulations, and the, the big ones who are re- already winning, you know, it's like a, a Google, Microsoft, and maybe maybe another a player like Claude would always win because they have the resources in order to apply these regulations and and uh, uh, all the legal help they need in order to have really responsible AI. So That's it's right. like the balance between the small co- uh, competition. Um, companies, startups using these regulations in order to grow and not be too risky. On the other right. hand, it's like you don't want them to die just because they need so much 
uh, you know, help and, and resources in order to stand up to these, right? That's right. Which is, it's very problematic to have all these regulations when you're just starting, you know, you just want it to work. And then right. just to think right. about how to make it work with all these uh, additional uh, barriers, it's really hard. That's right. That's right. That's why it's, ex yeah. it's exciting. Some of the work that the way that OpenAI started, and I don't know if it's, you know, the, they've, they've had an exodus to some people recently, but the way they started, uh, the, the Anthropic team, for instance, is really focused on the alignment challenge. And they have a lot of the early OpenAI guys that were focused on the alignment challenge. I, I think that's, these people know so much more. And so, uh, you know, having, having, uh, uh, you know, sort of regulations that run through that group. And obviously you have to look at self-interest if you're a for-profit business, which makes it challenging. Yeah. But I think there's some really good people over there, uh, thinking about things in the right way. Yeah. You know, it started as an open source. That's why they're called open AI. And, you know, all, all the stuff that Elon Musk said that he invested in a nonprofit and now they're totally right. for profit and part of Microsoft. And I think that if I'm not mistaken, there is this like, I think that he's suing Sam Altman, but I'm not sure about it. Uh, and, and it's all related to that because it's so powerful. And so probably, giving yeah. this power to a few people on earth, they might be the most smart people ever, but it's, at least it's, it's like, it's not proportionate to the amount of power they have in their hands. So That's it's right. hard and, to, and, to manage. Absolutely. And then when you stop and think there are 8 billion people on earth right now, right? But only a few people have the, the, the technology. It's really, it's really pretty, uh, pretty shocking from a historical standpoint, you know? Right. And, and it's, it's so um, wide and pervasive and it's going to change so many domains in so many areas. And it's, um, it makes you think about how to distribute this kind of power and how to even like balance it in a way. Um, and in general, you know, I had a few people talking about responsible AI in my last uh, few episodes was dedicated oh. to that. Oh, great. And, okay, and for me, it's like, I don't really trust the regulations and the legal authorities to do that because we see what's going on in social media. And it's like 20 yep. years that we have Facebook more or less and right. nothing really substantial was really done there. Right? Although right. we already know there are implications on society, whatever, and, and on right. young people and nothing really right. changed, right? They're doing whatever they want. So yeah. do you think and it's so going to be different in that case? Fake news stories, right? Just yeah. I, I said fake news stories. I felt like Donald Trump for a second, but but truly, <laughs> yeah, really false, false stories. And and you know, I, I remember in the '90s, people were talking about uh, uh, they were talking about moral relativism. Do, do you remember that? Uh, and so people were talking about moral relativism and and the problem that it could be and and all that kind of. And and so you know, we hit it with social media, right? Because people go, yeah. well, they start to say, well, I don't know if that's true, and then some people say, well, it's true for me. Well, this other thing is true for me. And now all yeah. of a sudden you're getting away from objectivity, right? And so that's right. But they still haven't solved that to your point. And that's a lot simpler uh, thing it would seem to solve than the guardrails around uh, the use of artificial intelligence. Of course. And if we're taking that already, that we are questioning what's true, then, and it's very easy to create images and videos which are not really, and it's hard to, to understand that they're AI and not real. Uh, it's really hard for us to understand what's truth and what's not. Uh, right. And therefore, the implications, other than the fact it could change our workforce and it could change the way that we do things and decision-making, just the way that we perceive reality is going to change. That's right. So, so And, and I, it's not that I don't trust Sam Altman or any other entrepreneurs right. out doing that, but it's like sure. too much to handle for someone. Yeah, definitely. So what are some key metrics that VCs would look at, uh, at when they're evaluating AI startups? Well, and I, th and I think probably most people on the, uh, you know, most people that listen to your podcast would, would have heard a lot of, of a lot of these, right? But you always want to look mm -hmm. at the team, right? What's the experience of the team? How long has the team been together, right? Do they have a history of working together? You know, Peter Thiel talks about, uh, I think in the book Zero to One, he talks about looking at teams. And if somebody went to a, a networking event and met someone and said, you know, I think we should start a company together, he said, it's probably not a good bet, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, you know, right. 
always makes me laugh, right? Uh, yeah. You know, because he's a little, uh, um, but, but I think that, you know, understanding that, right? Starting there, who's, who's the team? And then what, what experience do they bring? Do they have the experience to be able to roll this out? Now, you don't always need uh, deep experience, like from the leader within a domain, right? If you look at Elon Musk with uh, SpaceX, he'd not been a, you know, uh, he wasn't a, a, a rocket scientist, right? But, you know, he was able to look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective. What's the biggest cost to the rocket? Okay, how do you, you know, how, how do you cut down on the cost, make it reusable? How do you make it reusable? And then he found the team, though, to be able to uh, create the reusable rocket, right? And then he focused on cost, bringing the cost down. Um, yeah. Obviously, he came close to failing a couple of times. Uh, yeah. Is, is competent and as smart and as uh, capable as he is. So I think he's that, very smart. Did you see the, the interview with him? Which one? The last one he had with Jordan Peterson, two hours. No, no I have not seen it yet. I, 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 oh, you should. It's a really good interview. And, and you see that he's, he, he, he was very smart even as a kid, which is yeah, like he amazing. He said that he read all the scriptures when he was like 11. And I have a kid who's living. I'm telling you, he's not really interested in that. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, I, I remember I, I, I read the whole, you know, I read the, all the scriptures are like 18, you know, because somebody, somebody had a, it was my dad had a, a book called the, it was like the chronological Bible or something. Yeah. So I said, I'm just going to read this because it broke it down in a days. And so, you know, it was like, uh, it was, it, we were all making New Year's resolutions. You know, and so I yeah. looked at it and I said, well, I'll, I'll read this this year. Very interestingly, if you look at the um, Old Testament compared to the New Testament, right? The, the Torah plus the other books compared to the New Testament, 10 and a half months was the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Only six weeks is the New Testament. Kind of crazy, yeah. right? Yeah, it and, is. And Moses took up, in, in that book, just the sections on Moses took up 10 weeks. So longer, just what was written about Moses was longer than the entire New Testament. Yeah. I, th I thought that was fascinating, right? Yeah, it is. The, the and I think up. that he read the Quran too, if I'm not mistaken. He's just, he read everything. And he said I that he, that. Me, me neither. <laughs> But I think that what he mentioned is that he has this kind of a, a crisis that he felt that he needed to understand the world when he was 11. So it's yeah. like, of course, he is a, a bit smarter than most people or a bit like deeper and see things differently. I, I yes. would imagine that yes. it's very hard to find an entrepreneur like Elon Musk, uh, mostly. And I, I would imagine, like, when you're having a deep tech technology, um, right. some of these startups would use a third party and they're just really using a, a model that is already built, a foundational model. But if they're building a model themselves, they really need to understand deep technology. Do you see these people as different kind of entrepreneurs or are they just any other technology and it doesn't really matter? You know, I, I, I think when you're thinking about deep tech uh, technology, yeah, I, I see them a little bit differently uh, in terms of they, you know, I, I think a lot of people who are attracted by this, uh, by the field of technology would aspire to be in deep tech related to the technology itself, right? So like, what problem can I solve? How do I solve it? I think what happens or what has happened, and I'm not the first person to say this by any means, this is a common, it's sort of a conventional answer, but I think a lot of people have focused on um, what's the fastest way to scale, right? Scalability is important, you know, it's right. important. To, you know, otherwise you may not have a business. And even Elon Musk, Uh, I'll just interject this quickly. The first thing he did was Zip2, right? So he put, he says he put the yellow pages of the phone book on the internet in 1995 and then sold it and made about 22 million. But he would say like, what a dumb business that was. But he yeah. had to get started, right? Sure. And then he could go on PayPal. And then from PayPal, I could go into SpaceX and Tesla. But I think that there's this, there's the business component. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs that get into the business side and they're working on some of the solutions related to, Uh, you know, putting something on the internet back back uh, in the day, or then putting it on the smartphone, and then creating an app, and those kinds of things. They are pulling together technical expertise, uh, understanding of finance, understanding of business, and there are a lot of very smart people in that space. 
But when you're going to the next level and you're saying, I want to create uh, a technology that will really move the needle, uh, that that takes somebody with a much higher tolerance for risk, uh, an understanding of um, not just the implications of building the technology, but also the time frame. So how do you project engineer something? How do you project manage something? How do you deal with long time frames, supply chain issues, regulatory issues? You're getting into more of a complicated space. I've uh, I had a background in real estate development and renewable energy as well, and just the regulatory issues you face uh, in, in those fields. It, it, you know, think about building an apartment building. It takes you seven years in LA to find mm-hmm. the site, go all the way through to where you have leased up the site, and now you're putting it into a portfolio or you're selling it. Seven years of your life. Wow. So think of. That's like almost two high school or college. That's like going all yeah. the way through high school, having your kid all the way, go all the way through high school, almost all the way through college. Before yeah, the it's like two or three startups. That's right. One after that's the right. consecutive it's, ones. It's silly, right? It's kind of silly. Yeah. And, and it's not even a new technology. You're building a building. People have been doing it for a uh, couple thousand years, a few thousand yeah. years, right? Silly. Yeah. So I, I think that, um, you know, I think that's the, the, the deep tech person has the patience, the foresight, the long range view. Uh, to be able to do that. And, you know, it's a diff- it's pulling together a lot of different disciplines in, in one person who can then recruit and inspire a team. So they have to be visionary, but they also have to, you have to, you have to believe them, right? Yeah. So yeah, of course. Believe, it's hard. Believe Elon Musk, you know? Yeah. That but he knows every, what he's know. doing. That's right. That's Before right. he gets to be Elon Musk, you mean? Because right, right now, when he's, he could do whatever he wants and everybody would just believe him. But well, there, I, there, there are a couple of stories that, uh, that you might have heard when he did the Zip2 program and he was building the, you know, saying he was going to put people on the internet. From, from what I understand, and I've, read a, I've seen it in a couple of books, uh, the most recent being Walter Isaacson's book on Elon Musk. Uh, there was a story where he built what they called like the supercomputer. And really, it was just a computer. Have you heard this? It was just a computer like in a frame and they painted it black, the frame. And so it looked, and they'd roll it around like, well, we're going to upload you into this. You know, it was, it was a prop, right? Yeah. But people go, oh, wow, the su- supercomputer, you know? So if, if, if you owned a bar or a few restaurants and you didn't really know much about the internet, it was the nineties, you'd think, well, this guy knows, right? Yeah. So he's, that's a business, like a marketing savviness, right? Or when he was lobbying space tech uh, or, or, or lobbying, uh, on space tech, on SpaceX to the Congress, right? There was an event at the Smithsonian that he went to and he parked an 18 wheeler with the old dead rocket that spray painted SpaceX on the side out in front of the Smithsonian. So people drove by and said, Oh my gosh, he's got a rocket there. They're, they're, they're legit, right? Yeah. The rocket wouldn't fly at that point, but yeah. it's that sense of uh, marketing savvy where people say, well, he's doing it. There it is. There's yeah. the product, right? Yeah, he knows yeah. how to do it. That, that's for sure. And, and I think what you said about deep tech is is um, the type of entrepreneurs that needs this long term vision. Long term in in startups, it's like more than three years, more or less. Like three years is like the top of a startup. You need to do something and to show growth within this like two or three years uh, time span. And and when you're thinking that you need to invest the time, efforts, resources. You know, to build something which is substantial, especially if it's a big model. Right now, That's when right. we're talking about smaller models, you don't need that because you already have open source models or third party right. uh, foundational models. So you don't need that. But you need a way to understand reality a bit differently and a set of skills that is different than, than other um, entrepreneurs. But I'm, I'm just wondering, you're, you said about the team, when they're coming over do you look mm-hmm. for the interactions between the the founders? Do you see how they talk to each other, if they relate differently? Or you really ask them, where did you meet? What did you do? All of that. You ask them very directly, yeah. And then you kind of watch how they work together. And you're looking for a set of complementary skills. And you really can. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying I've, I've broken it down and, and, and spilled it out. But um, if you... If you look at personality theory, and I, and I know this is this has been uh, some people have criticized it in recent years. You know the idea of personality theory because we're all unique, and it's true. We're we're yeah. all unique, right? However, if you were to take like the Myers Briggs type indicator, right? It's a pretty simple one, or the the DISC, right? Dominant influencer, 
uh, uh, supportive, uh, uh, conscientious, right? And say like, uh, or the Enneagram, right? You can look at these different personality theories and say, okay, that person, uh, that person builds tech that, you know, they're that type, they're, they're a craftsperson, right? On the Myers-Briggs. That person is a salesperson. This other person is a visionary thinker. This other person is a concrete detail-oriented thinker. You want to see the complementary set of skills um, across a team. Uh, in other words, if you just had two visionaries and they both like to talk a lot and they both like to plan out their vision, but nobody's executing uh, the details, that yeah. wouldn't make a good team, right? It, it, that, yeah. It's not likely to happen, but but it happens sometimes, right? Yeah, and so, vice versa, if you just in the details. Then. That's right. Like we built the best code ever. Okay, who's the who's the client? I don't know, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, I just talked to a startup exactly that. They're, they're very professional. They have like professors in their team and they are in, into the the details and, and they have no one to just view the other side. Like, who are yes. you selling to? How do, do you sell it? And, That's right. they, and they're so enthusiastic about the technology. Like they oh, really yeah. love it, which is great, oh, yeah. but it's not enough, right? So no, it's they not have enough, a very good solution, but... Yeah, oftentimes you find... Uh... Because I've I, I've been in the situation before too when I've, people have approached me to help them with their with their startup or something. Uh, sometimes you find in that case that they because they have a history of developing the technology, but but they can't sell it to anybody. They don't know how to bring it online. They don't know how to scale the company. They don't know how to raise money. They, they don't know how to do any of these things. So they're sitting with that technology, but they'll say, "Well, um, we own you know the majority of this. We're not really going to share it with other people. Sales is easy." Yeah, it's like, it's, like you know it's I mean? not that important as we are very important. smart and they are not. We're very right. smart. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, those guys, they, they're terrible and whatever. But you see, if, yeah. like even now you can look back from, I can look back from a few years ago. They haven't done anything yet. They continue to have meetings. Yeah. And then, you know, they talk to people and then people go, hmm, okay. But, but they haven't really made any headway, you know? Yeah. In general, you know, I come from UX and design and product, so I'm not a technical person. And I started way, way back that we just had startups with only technical people. It's like, these are the startups oh. we met back then. They didn't yeah. have product for, for sure. They didn't have like marketing and sales. Maybe they added someone that will do the, you know, whatever is needed in order to sell. That's it. And right. in the beginning, you felt that they are so sure of themselves and they right. know everything. It was very, it, it was kind of a fight to, to persuade them that there is something more than the technology and, right. you know, everything changed. And now if you don't have a good branding, if you don't have a good story, if you don't, if you cannot sell, if you're not focusing on your, your users and, you know, like Steve Jobs saying everything is for the end users and you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. If you don't have all these additional um, uh, functions within your company, you have no no way because the competition is much harder. That's uh, right. You have no way, and 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 I think that these very smart people are more balanced in a way, and and maybe I hope uh, their ego is a bit like a bit a bit smaller right. <laughs> because they know right. you cannot make it just to have very smart people around. It's like right. smart, cognitive, analytical people, whatever. Right, right. That's right. It's, it's not That's right. I think Steve Jobs is a great example of that. Yeah, he was yeah. totally into marketing and understanding technology. It's right. like a visionary. Right. How can AI startups best, best pitch their ideas to VCs and secure funding? What would be your like? You no, know, I think, you know, and, and this, goes, this goes back, I think, to... Uh, There, there are the typical questions, right, that a VC would want to hear. Like, what's yeah. your, what's, what's your clear, uh, you know, problem statement? Like, what yeah. problem are you solving that's unique? You know, and then, and then, and then, uh, why is it? Why is that the main problem? Why are you the right team to solve that specific problem? How big is the market for that problem? Right. And obviously, people get this wrong all the time. I, th I, th I remember during the during the clean tech, the first clean tech wave, right. Uh, before clean tech became clean tech's not so it's it's more energy now right so you would say like clean energy right it's not really a technology anymore because it's been adopted at scale and so now you would say well that's you know that operates more like a 
you know, there's, there's an engineering and development component, there's a construction component, there's an energy component, right? I think at the beginning, they were going to VCs and they were saying, hey, I, you know, what's the market for energy? It's the whole world. And, you know, so it's, it's infinite, you know? It's like, well, yeah. no, because you're not putting in there all the different types of energy and like who's going to adopt your energy and why are they going to pay more for your energy? And it's obvious in hindsight for all of us, right? But at yeah. the time, you remember like uh, 07, 2007, it was like, wow, right? And it was exciting. Uh, it, it was exciting. And I think we're going to hit that again. You know, we'll hit that again with, with nuclear fusion at some point. But I think based on the experience of 07, a lot of people, at least who were in business at that time, will remember uh, kind of the, the, the story, right? Like, well, how do you adopt it? How do you, how do you facilitate bringing it in? Um, so, so, you know, those, those questions, and, and then you're looking at go-to-market strategy, you're looking at, um, you know, how do you, how do you scale up the business over time? Right. And you also need to think about what is your, what's the game plan in the future, right? Is it, is it going to, uh, you know, what, what, what are the different, uh, like, where do you want to end up, you know, at the end? You start there and then you come back to what's your minimum viable product and how do you keep yeah. it going and nurture it and, and grow it over time? You know, so I, yeah. I'm, I always think of like, okay, start with a clear vision and then come back and like, well, how do you get to next quarter, to next quarter, to next quarter? And how do you ramp up? You know, and then who do you need on the team as you go and what resources do you need? And then, uh, and then you also want to look for resilience in the founding team. So are, are they yeah. going to hang in there when the going gets tough, you know, um, and, and you have to think about all kinds of things related to life because nobody's just a, just a worker, right? Everybody has a, has a whole life, you know, and then sure. and what, are, what are the effects on the culture over time? You know, how does a company stabilize over time? Those kinds of things. Yeah. I think what you, what you said about uh, the last part is uh, looking for flexibility of these people because they surely would have some kind of barriers and challenges on the way. And maybe they need to pivot and maybe they need to change things. And are they aware of these unknowns and how to tackle them? Or even thinking about the unknowns is enough. In, you don't know yeah. it's an unknown. But yeah. I think that what right. you mentioned about like everybody could use it is, is a way of not taking really responsibility, right? Because if you're saying it's for everyone, it's just saying like, nobody's going to use it the same thing because you're right. not really focusing right. on who's, who's this market that you're addressing. And That's the same right. goes yeah. like, if it's like, yeah, the path is going to be ABC and not taking it into consideration that you might have additional circumstances. It means that you're not really thinking it thoroughly and, and you're not really ready to take on this really, really big chance of being an entrepreneur, ups and downs, you know, if, if they're experienced, they surely know it. But if they're young and very enthusiastic, sometimes they miss it. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And what then, is... Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, it's okay. I'm listening. Sorry. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's, a, there's all the trade-offs, right? It's, it's right. very nuanced. So, so when you're young, you have new ideas and you have optimism and more energy sometimes to pursue them. You're not, you're not fighting against... Uh, you know, the, the ghosts of the past, right. Where something didn't work out or something didn't go the way you thought those kinds of things. Right, on the other right. hand, when you're, and, and there's a really good book on this, uh, uh, it's called super founders. Have, have you read that? Mm. No, it's no. By, uh, uh, Ali Thomas, he's a VC over at uh, DC VC. Um, and he, uh, he, he wrote this book where he studied like all these founders. And so he said that there's a myth around like all the founders are, are 20, you know, he was saying yeah. most founders are like, you know, forties, fifties. Right. And they've, they've been, they've been in major companies. They've gone through several cycles. A lot of them bootstrap to a certain level before then they bring in uh, the first round of funding after they have a product. He was saying that's more the, the normal uh, thing that you'll see. Really? But the news is always on, wow, look at, you know, Snapchat or Zuckerberg or, you know, yeah, those, these those guys. Yeah. Yeah. I think the question is a successful entrepreneur, not only an entrepreneur. Uh, yes. In order to be successful, you need, as you mentioned, resilience is something that you get with age. It's very hard right. to be resilient when you're 20. 
And, right. and, and of course, the knowledge experience that you bring to the table is very important. As a person, how to relate to your team, how to decide who could be your partner, how to decide how to uh, recruit the right people, understanding the domain is very important. If you don't have enough knowledge, it will take you so long just to understand what you're building for, what is the, com- the competitive landscape, so forth. And if you have a That's few right. years in this specific domain, You have so much more advantages than someone who is, yeah, I, I know how to be an entrepreneur. Maybe I started entrepreneurship and I'm very en- enthusiastic and I have lots of energy, but m- much of these, like the energy could just be wasted and, and right. not really consumed in, in a good way, uh, for sure. Right. So what are some of the emerging trends and challenges that we see anticipate in the AI investment landscape? You know, I think... Um... One of the things that people are I mean we already touched on the ethics in AI and the alignment challenge uh, we we didn't ch- touch on the fact that th- there is there is this idea of a talent shortage in in, in AI mm-hmm. um, and so yeah people are trying to ramp up quickly and understand it better but if you're looking at that next level of talent some some of the VCs I've or, I'm sorry some of the uh, entrepreneurs I've talked to don't really have any experience. at all in AI at this point. So right. they're, you know, the, the challenge there is you're building on top of, you know, uh, somebody else's system. So, this, well, we're using open AI and we're prompting it this way. And, uh, okay, what's your background? And well, I was in mortgage banking, but we're right. going to use it for those kinds of clients. Okay, great. But who's, who's on the technical side on your team that's doing this. Right. So I, I, I think we're, we're, um, th- there is a bit of a talent shortage there. And I'm not saying that, uh, I'm just saying the risk there obviously is that they'll they'll miss something you know um and so i think I think that's one of the one of the challenges I think that one of the trends would be uh this idea of edge a i right and so you know um models deployed on devices right and the internet of things uh those to- those sorts of applications people are 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 really starting to focus uh mm-hmm. focus there as a trend. Uh, which obviously is going to catch on again, the growth in AI is exponential, so by yeah several months from now it won't even be a trend it'll be like yeah. part of AI you know yeah i have um, a i have a um it's I'm not sure, but when I'm thinking about edge uh devices, I'm thinking about apple and uh, you mm-hmm. know it 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 seems yeah. like they're in they're on the sidelines, but they're not, mm-hmm. and when they come like full. fully in in a full energy into this race I don't know who's they're gonna leave everyone behind with the devices and the hardware and all of that that's right and i i have a I have a friend that works on the uh her role is literally it's it's confidential role she can't talk about anything she works on sure and her background is in neuroscience and cognition and so and she has a doctorate in that so she she's over there working on I don't know what, right? So I'll ask her like, well, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. Just really love it. You know, we're really sort of uh, off to the side a little bit in our group at Apple, you know, working on these longer term things. Like what? Well, I can't really talk about it. Which is <laughs> yeah. kind of, and of course you want to hear about it, right? Like, yeah, well, it's, interesting. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. In general, I think it's, it's very suspicious that they're as if they're staying behind. I don't yeah, believe it. It's, it's, no, no, they're not staying behind. <laughs> Yeah, even even uh, there was a joke, I forgot that I think I saw a skit the other day where they were joking about the they said, "What's the innovation on the iPhone 16? There's a new button for a camera. That's it. <laughs> That's all you're working on? Obviously not. It's Apple, right? Yeah, I'm sure yeah. something's going to happen, and even just before just because of the fact that they have the resources to do it, even if they don't have the talent, they have the resources and they have the market and they have the talents uh, and and they could do it. And, That's right. and, and when I think about what, going back to the, what we said about who is going to dominate, dominate this, this domain, I, I feel I, I'm a bit worried because um, I'm just thinking about how big Apple right now is. Yeah. Like, it, it's so huge and so, so powerful. And right. do we really need uh, to, to, do they really need to gain more power? I, I don't think so, but uh, nobody asked me. <laughs> <laughs> well, believe it or not, no one asked me either. <laughs> yeah, it's, it yeah. seems like, you know, um, 
when you're thinking about social media, if we were talking like uh, 15 years ago, nobody would imagine it will be such, such a huge thing in, influencing uh, political uh, points of views and, and, and like changing society point. for, yeah, for, that's for so long. And now we are just in the beginning, like we're just in the, like when Mark Zuckerberg met uh, these two guys and took everything from them, this is where we are in AI, you know, the, the beginning of the story. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, we're trying uh, to imagine what would be like 15, 10 years from now. And it's, it's going to be so huge. That's and, a great point. You know, I always, you, you, I always like uh, talking to you, Adi. You always make me think about, uh, think about, <laughs> you know, you always sure. give me more to think about. Sure. Yeah. So now it's like I'm giving you homework. You have, you need that's to right. go. <laughs> right. Yeah, I gotta go back. Yeah, yeah. But but you're right. You're right. That's we're at that point where Zuckerberg took the idea and quietly yeah. went back to his room and worked on he it. He did right? whatever. Like yeah. the beginning of the movie. Yeah, that's is right. Now. That's right. Right. So, what is your number one tip for leaders today? Oh gosh, I think uh, that's a good question. I think that. One one of the things that I, you know, I would start by saying the thing, a couple of things I I I hate when people say right. So I and I I, I typically am not a guy that that hates anything. I, I wouldn't <laughs> categorize myself that way. It's more like, you know, as long as people have their own people have their own freedom to live their lives, right? And sure. I, I support that. And I think everybody's everybody has some sort of unique and special talent that they can bring to bear on the world. So I think everybody's fairly equal that way. In terms of you know now not equal in every category but equal in, in their own way they have a special talent right the whole the whole question is like is like for each of us how do you find it so I think that uh, what I what I hate to hear is when somebody ident overly identifies with a field or a role like well I'm a this person and I and I might be feeling that way because we're raising money right now so you you have investors who go well, I only invest in real estate you know and it's like well. Yeah. It's been kind of tough for like five years now, right? Right. And with interest rates up and costs up and rents can't keep going up because it hurts people, right? So you say, well, that's not that's not really a, a great program this year. Um, but I, but I, you know, you, I, I'm especially hearing that all the time right now. I'm this, or I only do that, or I identify this way. And so I think the challenge that there's there's a couple of challenges. Number one, like what? First of all, today, what is your core purpose or your core mission? Right. So what problem are you trying to solve? What do you what do you care about? Passionate that the word gets overused. Right. But it really is that yeah. same question. Like what what do you care enough about to work hard on to try to solve today? And that'll that'll keep you and, and, and motivation is another kind of word that gets overused. Right. But we're all looking for that. What's the thing we get excited about? I mean, I see it with you and, and, uh, and the different things you're working on. Uh, and I think that's a good example to your listeners. And I think that um, that everybody should find what am I excited about first, then, because because that that'll sustain you, right? You'll have to work hard anyway. Steve Jobs talked about that, yeah. I think, in that Stanford speech. Right? You got to work hard yeah, anyway. Might as well right. love what you're doing. Secondly, though, and this gets into like uh, you, you were talking, we were talking about religious ideas earlier, or at least spiritual ideas. This idea of, uh, uh, you know sort of having these different circles of karma, right? And that's, I mean, that's, you know, I've, I, I'm no expert in that, but I've, I've read about it, right? So you say like, uh, uh, you're getting closer theoretically as life goes on toward your core or your main mission, right? Or, or like why you're here, but you might have several roles as you go. So not getting stuck with like, well, now I'm a this, oh, this doesn't work for me anymore. Now I'm that. And then, you know, thinking about, uh, other, you know, we're, we're so quick to go back and say, well, that's what our grandparents did or our parents. And they had one career their whole life and then they got a pension. It was okay. That was one specific little moment in time, right? right. Humans have only been around for 250,000 years. We only had that for like 80 years. Maybe you could go back to middle ages and say there were ideas of guilds, but even that wasn't that long in human history. Maybe that was, a, maybe it's been a thousand years, right? right. When people had something they did and they always did that. Um, so we have to really think that that's over right now. So how do you stay agile, adaptable? How can you uh, embrace some core things that you care about and skills that you develop related to those things you're passionate about? 
while at the same time not getting stuck in a title or or run round. You have to be able to pivot quickly and then also embrace lifelong learning, obviously. But everything's going to keep changing faster and faster. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. have, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, if you told me, hey, you're, you're, you know, you're going to have somebody on your team that you're going to ask for a marketing report and they're going to go put it in chat GPT and send it back to you in five minutes. And it's going to be 10 pages long, right? Yeah. Uh, I would have said, no, no way. No way, right? Right. Because really for $20 a month, you've, you've got a, a you know, you, you have an entire extra worker, right? Or multiple extra workers. Sure. Um, that's an amazing technology, but, but, you know, how do you, obviously this is simple too. This is a very, very simple concept, but how do you prompt it? Are you getting the right material? Uh, so there are all these things to learn and there will be all these things to learn for a long time. And that's how we want it to be. Cause that's how we're going to advance. So when I think about, you know, what do I want right now? I want to be able to uh, enable the development of new technology right, to solve societal problems and enable human flourishing and not just the United States, but around the world. Because as people are able to flourish more, you have a greater chance for peace, for understanding, uh, and for people to reach their potential and feel more fulfilled. So that's, that's how I think about, you know, if I'm going back and I'm, you know, make, having a bunch of calls with people, right, or, or we're trying to raise a fund or something, why are we doing it? Well, it's for that. You know, it's, it's much bigger than just yeah. We need to raise, you know, this many millions of dollars for this fund, you know? Yeah, you're so right. Yeah. So I, I, I think having that sense of vision or mission uh, as, yeah. as you go through. Yeah. I love the, the answer that is not like too technical. It's like a, a visionary view of, of what you're doing. And it reminds me like I, I'm each year I'm studying something and it has to be unrelated to what I'm doing. So two years ago, I studied ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And mm. it's, it's, a, it's a type of CBT therapy and like acceptance, it. meaning we accept what's go, what we're going through and we're uh, relating to our emotions. But the commitment part is the interesting part as I see it, because sometimes when you're thinking about therapy or technology, uh, not technology, but psychology, we're always thinking about being very uh, empathic <laughs> to what people are going through. And the commitment what is what you're talking about, is the values that we have and we're aiming for. So it's not enough to, to accept whatever we're going through. We have a goal. We have a view of what we want to achieve. And in parallel to accepting what's going on in our lives, we need to achieve something. And we, ha we aspire to have something. And this is very important to have some kind of a purpose of a, or a mission for people. And once they have a mission, it's not about them. It's not that I need to be a CEO or I need to yes. be successful. It's That's like, right. this is what I want to achieve. And, and once you're saying like, I want to uh, make the, the world better or help people to, uh, to get to their full potential, or I want to help, I don't know, entrepreneurs to find a way to help these people. Yes. And, and once you have that in front of you, it's not you. And right. once, once it's right. not like I need to be the biggest investor and most successful investor and make most of most money, right. which could be a goal. It's not, it's not that I have anything against money. Right. And, sure. and it's, and, and I think it's, it's too narrow, you know, to hold you into that it direction. Is. And, and once is. you have this vision or a purpose, uh, it keeps you more uh, interested in, in the end result. And then you could be flexible with yourself. You could That's have right. this goal as a as an investor, as a mentor, as, as someone who's doing volunteering with with entrepreneurs or with kids, whatever. It's like yes. the same goal could be a, you could aspire to be that in so many other ways, and then you don't have this like that is me, and this is what I need to do. And, That's right. And and when I'm thinking about AI, you know, it's gonna change the workforce for sure. It's going to shape our, our world, our roles, the way that we interact with technology. Uh, how do we interact with each other? What would be the, the positions we would have in general and, and our kids would have and skills that they need? It's, it's going to change. And once we're still curious and not afraid, we have the possibility to grow with it instead of like collapsing into something which is too frightened and closed. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think that was... Uh... That was beautiful the way you worded that. I think that when you 
you know, having the, the, the bigger mission, it's sort of like, uh, I remember, remember talking with somebody who was an expert public speaker, you know, um, it was actually, it was actually, uh, was talking with him and a, and a former president actually. And these two guys were saying, when you go to give a speech, right. And this was when I was young, I was in my early twenties. When you go to give a speech to a group, so don't think that the advice was don't think about yourself for your performance. It's not a performance. It's not a, you're not performing, you know, you're, you're yeah. really instead think, what do they want? Like, what are they looking for out of this? How can I help them? And how can I be open? And so that idea of like, yeah, prepare so that you know your subject matter, but also be open to the moment, right? Don't, don't rehearse it. Don't memorize it because then you're in the last moment, but be there with them and give them what they need. And they said, it's more of a service, you know? Yeah. And uh, I mean, this, this, uh, this president was an expert at walking in and not having any notes and just being able to go with wherever the crowd went, you know? And so he, he would meet people beforehand, get their input, ask some questions. You know, he'd like to get their really asked questions. What are they thinking about? What are they talking about? And then he'd say, I got a number of questions related to this. So let's start there. And he'd start in that direction. And then he'd watch like a conversation, listen to people and where, where were they going? But that way he was fully present and in a conversation and not yeah. in a performance. And I think it's the same thing with the career, right? You're, you're intuiting as you go and you're trying to solve it. You're, you're working to solve a challenge versus, you know, uh, in a milestone that's personal or, or about your performance or how you look or whatever else. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're, you're not as aware of like self indulgent like you're in into yourself and then yeah. you could be natural and right. and to be authentic with people and when you're not like into what would they think do they think right. i'm smart and am i saying right. the right thing and and in general you know i do lots of public speaking and for me i always know that they will not i think that they maya d'angelo said it i'm not sure that people would not uh, remember what you said but they would surely remember how you made them feel Great and quote, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that that's the quote, more or less the quote. Yeah, that's right. And, right. and I think that that is what's really important. When you're talking to people in general or speaking in events, it doesn't matter. You need to be aware of where they are and how do they yes. relate to what you're saying, which is yes. the most important. Like listening is more important than talking. And, and oh, the same goes, goes when you're just dealing with life or business or whatever. When you're tuned to outside, to listen, to be curious, to be aware of what could be empathic to other people, then you're getting more for yourself. It's like, it's the other way around. Most people say like, when you're thinking about yourself and you're very aware about yourself and you're really deeply thinking about what happened to you and your parents and what could happen, you know, it makes you so anxious and too much self-aware that you're not really right. capable of doing other things. And, yes. and it's really important, it's surely for today, you know, for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Perry, it's been a pleasure talking to you as always. We should have more conversation because it's always fun. So thank you for, for coming. Absolutely. Thank you for being with me. It's been such, such an insightful talk. And uh, I want to ask you, where could people hear more about your work and about uh, your group? Oh, that's, well, you know, I'm... Uh, People could find people can find and connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's that's an easy way, uh, you know. And or, or watch watch for our company page on LinkedIn, Unity Growth Ventures, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, we're at UnityGrowthVentures.com as well. But if people want to connect, they can DM me on LinkedIn, and uh, and you know we're, we're always happy to to meet more people and and have more conversations with people that care about uh, the same kinds of things that we care about. Thank you, Ferry. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you, buddy. And to all of you change makers out there, thank you for joining us. And I see you next week with another innovative, insightful talk. See ya. Bye-bye.